the game of entrepreneurship is so ugly. You make one bad mistake, you're dead. The business world, it's a very mafia-esque type of a business. If you look the other way, just because you just made a million dollars in a month and you start getting very arrogant, boom, you're wiped out. If the vision's crystal clear and then you know how to sell it, the rest is history. I'm running a business and I'm competing in a marketplace, a $5 trillion industry. How is that even possible for a guy like me, an immigrant? I like immigrants because immigrants have a chip. They have a point to prove. People that were born in America, you guys have no clue what gift has been given to you being raised in Iran. I miss the part of being playful. We were in war and all we're hearing is the whistles. Not a lot of stuff throws you off at that point. Self-improvement became an obsession. If you're trying to be the best version of yourself every day, that's how I think you get to greatness. It's not about me against you. It's about PBD against PBD's capacity, and I'm chasing this. Spend some time asking the right questions from yourself. Ask yourself what you're looking for. From there on, if you stay true to the vision, the world better get out of your way. They say that the human race is doomed, that we have lost touch with our true nature, that the media has corrupted us, and that the planet has no future. I disagree. I believe that humanity is full of hope and that our salvation lies within each one of us. My name is Brian Rose and my job is to listen, the oldest method of learning known to man. Each week I seek out individuals that are changing the world, people who are living and thinking in a different way. Their stories will challenge your beliefs, make you question your choices, and perhaps inspire you to change. I never planned on doing any of this, but now I can't stop. Join me on this mission and make humanity something we can all be proud of. As the host of Valuetainment, Patrick Bet David has had some unusual conversations. From mob bosses to Hollywood actors to NBA players, he really seeks out unusual people and gets them to tell all. But he had a weird journey in getting there. He was born in Iran, spent time in the military and then in poverty and built himself up as a businessman and now owns a large insurance company. But he really is about teaching people how to get to the next level in business and it's all about going inside. It's about finding your limitations and your limiting behaviors and trying to correct those and push yourself to the next level. I love Patrick. I love what he's about and we had a really hard conversation if you want to know what it takes to succeed in life. And at London Real, we push people every single day in our academy to succeed, whether they, they want to start a business from scratch in eight weeks, whether they want to publicly speak, or they want to broadcast themselves with their own podcast, we do all of that. This is a little bit more about it. London Real doesn't stop when the conversation ends. You see, that's when we get started. Because everything begins with a thought, and then comes the action. The London Real Academy is our global transformation platform. Here we bring together thousands of students from over 75 countries. Whether you want to build a profitable business from your passion, or learn to speak to inspire, or broadcast yourself with your very own podcast, or accelerate your life to become a high performance person, we have the online accountability course and personal mentoring program that will make your dream a reality. Join us and we'll take your life to the next level together. Our next accelerator course is starting soon.
This is London Real, I am Brian Rose. My guest today is Patrick Bet David, the creator of the YouTube channel Valuetainment, which takes complex leadership management and entrepreneurial ideas and converts them into simple life lessons. After fleeing to America from Iran at age 10, you later joined the military and then went to work in finance before starting your own company, PHP Agency, in 2009. Valuetainment now has over one million subscribers, posting interviews with a wide range of high-performance people, including mob bosses, Hollywood actors, and NBA Hall of Famers. Patrick, welcome to London Real. Yes, good to be here. Great to have you. First of all, how's the city treating you? What do you think of London? What's what's your perspective? You know, I gotta tell you, when I was coming in, everybody was like, oh my gosh, London, you know, they're snobby, they're full of themselves, et cetera, et cetera, but nice people. I mean, very pleasant, you know, good restaurants, great food. Uh, it's got a, uh, if, 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 if London, you know, it would be a combination between Paris, New York, if Paris and New York came together and had a baby, it would be something like London. Okay. That's the feeling I it's get. It's a little style, a little bit of a buzz. I like it a lot. I mean, that would be an understatement. It's a, every uh, year we decide to take our guys, our agents to some part of the world and we go and have a good time. Like we just went to Croatia, we went to Santorini and we went to Venice. We went to Dubai prior to that. Uh, we went to Tuscany and had a 20,000 square foot place and we brought everybody and their spouses and chefs. The next one is Tahiti. This is on the list as a final one after okay. my trip here. I'm, am- I'm amazed by the city. Yeah, I love it. You know, I was in New York for many years and you know, it's great when you're young, but it can be like super intense, that place. Yes. For me, this is a kind, gentle place. It's got some green space. People are nice, access to the continent. So yeah, you gotta come back. Oh, th- this is definitely not gonna be the last time. <laughs> First of all, I wanna start and just say, I appreciate what you do, you know, because there's not many people in this space that are going out there and putting out these long form conversations. And I know how hard it is. Mm. And I always say the mark of a professional is someone who makes it look easy. And you make it look easy, but I know it's not. And you're on the road putting out some pretty fantastic, you know, conversations that are out of the mainstream, even the mainstream YouTube podcast audience. Mm. And so that's incredible. And before we get into everything, and I wanna go deep into lots of stuff, I was wondering, first of all, I'm sure you get asked this, but I wanna know, top three favorite guests of all time. And how do you choose a guest? That's it. so top three favorite. Obviously, Michael Francis has to be on the list because we're very good friends now. Okay, like and who is I, he for people that don't know? He is a um, highest paid mobster since Capone. Two billion dollars of career earnings. He was making six to eight a week, reporting to Paul Castellano and uh, uh, Serpico, and uh, he had dealings with Gotti. He had dealings with Gravano. I mean, he had dealings with everybody. On the cover of Fortune magazine, 1986. They had the 50 most powerful mobsters in America. He was on that list, the youngest on that list at 35 years old. And so that's Michael Francis. Uh, You know, John McAfee was a creative one. It was a different one because John McAfee, the founder of McAfee, antivirus, right? Back to the mobster really quick. How can he talk to you about that stuff? You you know, it's a question that everyone asks and it's a question that I ask myself. I think the reason why he can't talk about that stuff today is because Mayor Giuliani did a good job getting rid of the mob. Him and Donnie Barasco, which is AKA Joe Pistone, right? Okay, right. Uh, If you've seen the movie movie Donnie Barasco, um, Giuliani played the role of trying to get rid of everybody. Four times he tried to arrest uh, Francis. He couldn't do it on the last case. Francis was on for like uh, 50 years or 100 years, some number like that, and then he ended up only getting uh, eight years, and he went and did the time and came back. And he just says, I'm gonna change my life. And then from that moment on, a lot of people went to prison. So their street credit that they had in the 80s disappeared. So the mob world of New York, Chicago, Philadelphia today isn't what it was in the 80s. 80s was peak. 80s was, they had judges bought, they had cops bought, they had chief of the police department bought, they had congressmen, senators bought, they had people at the top bought, they had, you know, even in the earlier 40s, they had J. Edgar Hoover bought, they had a lot of these guys bought. And uh, when you have things on them, the powerful people, you have info on them, you can, you can move a lot of things. Today, they don't have the same pulse. So for him to talk about it openly, there's not really anybody in the marketplace that's gonna do anything about it because right. everybody's in their 70s and their 80s or they're dead. Okay, so the, the other mobsters don't care and then the feds and the government doesn't care to put him away so he can talk. It's not that they don't care. Some of them have called me and they call me and the phone sounds like an F-bomb for an hour. I'm being that serious. Law with enforcement. You. I, in, in, law enforcement is one, but more 
mobsters, people who are in the world okay. of mob. They'll call me and they'll say, you know, the story with this, and I gotta tell you with this, and da 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 da. I'm like, listen. They want to tell you their version. They want to tell me their version. You but know, they won't so go on camera. They won't do it. No, okay. it's very interesting. But I said, so why don't you come and talk about it? No, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. Okay. Uh, interesting. So Michael's that part. Um, John McAfee would be another one because McAfee, y- y- you know, very very different, strange kind of a personality. Um, you know, he was, if, if, if social media was around in the early 90s, McAfee would be Dan Bolzerian on steroids. <laughs> That's what he would have been, because he was so eccentric. You know, if you see some of the stuff this guy, he did an antivirus commercial snorting cocaine and with 20 prostitutes in a video. It's a very weird, and that video went viral. I mean, you can go see it on YouTube. Crazy. So he sold the company for $100 million. We sat down at his house that he wouldn't give us the address until two hours before the interview and gives us the address, we go to his place, um, five guys there with AK-47s, with M16s, nine German Shepherds are outside, the entire time with the interview, he's got a gun right here, in the middle of the interview, somebody you know knocks on a door, guy jumps to the door with guns, uh, I'd say McAfee was uh, another one that was interesting, I like Pistone because the story of Donnie Barrasco and being an undercover FBI agent, You know, how do you go six years right. and play undercover in the Bonanno family, I mean, you and I may be able to act for an hour, maybe five minutes, maybe a day. A great actor can act for Daniel Day-Lewis, maybe six months, last of the Mohicans, he gets into that part. Can you imagine acting for six years? Yeah. That's what this guy did. So to be able to speak to that guy and ask him and say, look, you're an FBI agent, okay, for six years, but you were so into deep, you're partying, you're having that life. Did you at one point turn and say, you know, you wanted that life more than being the FBI agent? Right. And uh, he gave me the answer, but I didn't believe him. I said, I don't know if I buy it. What'd he say? He said, um, he said um, you know, no, I was always an FBI. I take a bullet for you, I take a bullet for him, I take a bullet from Bob, I'm not taking a bullet for a mobster. Mm. I said, you know, you seem like, you, you know, you act more like the mafia right now than Michael Francis does. Because when you speak to Pistone, if you had to sit down right now, and you don't know Michael Francis or Joe Pistone, and I tell you, you have to decide who's a mafia, who was a mobster, you'll never say Michael Francis. Hmm. You'll say Joe Pistone was a former mobster. And Michael's what, more soft-spoken and less the typical gangster you see in the movie? He is so soft-spoken. Interesting. He right. is so soft-spoken. And that tells yeah. you a lot about business, too. Yes, and he was, he was a, he, you know, he was going to be a doctor. Like, you went and got MIT, you went through that direction of yeah. what you did yourself, you know, uh, 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 as a guy that you do crazy and then nobody gets accepted and like no one, MIT would never accept somebody like me. You go on MIT, you gotta be somebody. This guy's going to become a doctor, Michael Francis. He's getting to become a doctor. His dad goes to prison, he gets upset, he goes to prison and says, I'm not gonna be a doctor. That's like, what are you talking about? He says, I'm gonna be a made man. He says, you're not gonna do this life. He says, I'm doing it, dad, you can't stop me. And then he changes wow. from wanting to be a doctor to being a made man to making two billion career earnings. So that's a very, interesting dynamic because what are you going to do be a doctor making 300 grand a year while these guys are making 300 grand a week yeah psychologically that's tough to accept yeah right it's tempting how do you explain this fascination with the underworld the mob bosses if you go to your website you've got movies to watch which is great and you got casino american gangster great movie by the way yes um the godfather <laughs> series casino you know what wh- what is it why why is that fascinating is it the entrepreneurship you know uh, i i just think there's a big element of that I think there's a big, I mean, I grew up, uh, my family was power plays, right? My mother's side, they were all communists. And so they hated the rich people all the time. Rich people are greedy. I mean, I hated rich people growing up. I had an uncle who was the richest uh, family in our, a person in our family. And I couldn't, I almost like didn't like this guy because my mom hated rich people. And they would talk about how bad rich people. My, my dad said they were imperialists. And imperialists, you know, they believe poor people are lazy. So imagine rich people are greedy poor people are lazy. I mean, these are bi- bipolar type of a relationship and these guys are fighting all the time and we had a lot of family politics and I never liked it. I never liked being bullied. I never liked being pushed around. I never liked those games at all. And so that kind of put me in a position where you had to learn the games people are trying to play with you to try to pin you against somebody. And if you don't know it, you're gonna get caught up in the spider web and all of a sudden five years goes by saying, why didn't I not like you? What was the issue here? And so, you know, the mobsters, the mafia family, that's the ultimate game because 
in the business world, you know, the worst thing that's going to happen to you is you're going to be put out of business. That's fine, okay? And you're going to have to find a way to come back three years, recover, save money, make money, make some good connections, and recreate yourself and come back and do something. In the mob world, you make one bad mistake, you're dead. It's game over. So it's the ultimate punishment you get. And so if you're willing to play in that game um, and you're willing to put that as the possibility of your worst case scenario, I want to know how that person's wired. I want to know those power plays. Uh, we run a business and we have a lot of enemies. The bigger we're getting, the more enemies we have. People who are my good friends 10 years ago, you know, I hear stuff they're saying behind my back where I'm like, okay, this is all starting to make sense because it's competition. I get it. You know, you want to take a marketplace away from you and I'm trying to make a name for myself. And we're coming up in an industry, financial industry, insurance industry, where the average agent is a 59-year-old white male and we are a 34-year-old uh, Hispanic female. That's not normal. We are a very weird company where the CEO is from Iran. What Iranian CEO is going to compete in the financial industry and life insurance that's a very political, very mafia-esque type of a business? Who's this new regime coming and taking over? So how do you do without stepping on the wrong person's toes and respecting that guy that just wants pure respect? He's not wanting anything from you. He just wants you to make sure in the rooms you respect him. All those dynamics you got to learn. Obviously, a lot of mistakes I've made as a rookie CEO coming up. But... Uh, that's my fascination. Hmm. And um, half of your workers are, more than half are women, more than half are, are yes. immigrants as well. Yes. Uh, like you are, like I am now. That's a completely different footprint, like you said, than your competitors. Why, why do that? Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? The, the eyeballs of an immigrant, you know, look at the eyes of an immigrant. It's different than somebody that's born in America. I mean, for me, you know, I go to America and I tell them, I say, I speak to people, I'm like, you guys have no clue what gift has been given to you, especially, people that were born in America, that they don't know any different. Like they'll get into a debate, and I had a big debate the other day in Argentina with this one guy, and he's just going off about how America sucks, and he's, a, he's making $1.5 million a year income. I'm like, what do you mean America sucks? I said, can you tell me another place you've lived for two years? No, how do you know? I said, so how do you know about another country? It's like the kid who's got a great father that's the disciplinarian bitching to another kid who lost his father in war. What do you mean, you know? about your father's a bad person. You, I wish I had your father. That's what the kid's saying. Yeah. So for me, it's like I'm living in America saying, are you kidding me? This country allows a guy like me, you know, 1.8 GPA, parents divorced, street kid, hoodlum, goes to the army, I get out, I get this fascination to want to read books, one guy believes in me, and then I get obsessed, and next thing you know, I'm running a business and I'm competing in a marketplace and a five trillion dollar industry, how is that even possible for a guy like me? So that's why I resonate with immigrants. Mm. I like immigrants because immigrants have a chip and I like women in this business because women have a chip. My number one earner is a woman, by the way, mm. Sheena. Mm. I like them, they're chippier, they have a point to prove. There's something going on there. Um, Same and is so, true in women's MMA, some of the best fights out there. That's right. They don't have to be there. They really have to push themselves to be there. And when I, when I watch them, I'm just like, wow, these are people that are spirited. They, they really, they, they have to prove themselves. It's so much easier to work with somebody that's got a point to prove. Huh. You know, it's so much easier. I mean, look at basketball. You know, it, you got a guy like Vince Carter. He comes into the gym, jumps 49 inches. Now, literally jumps out of the gym. He, the way he jumped and he would do dunks, insanity. They call him Vince Sanity, right? And you got a guy like Kobe Bryant that's coming up. He doesn't jump as high as the other guy does. And everybody's thinking Vince Carter's gonna have a better career in North Carolina, you know, following Jordan's career. Kobe's got a chip on his shoulder. Puts his number 24. Why 24? Jordan's 23. You're putting one over Jordan, 24. Scores 33,000 points. Obviously doesn't pass Jordan up, but the chip with less talent didn't have Jordan's hands. Look what Kobe does. 20 years with one team he plays. There's something very special about a controlled chip it's very, the key word there is control. Right, and that's been the story of yeah. your life. It's been a story of my life because every time the, the chip's not been in control, I've screwed up and God knows I've screwed up so many times. Oh my gosh, I've screwed up so many times when my chip has not been controlled. Which, which looks like what? When the chip is not controlled, you get angry, it becomes all about you? Yeah, it's, it becomes all about you and you lose perspective. This is why I don't like alcohol. And this is why I don't like drugs, because I don't, you're, you're not in control. A substance is doing that, right? 
And so imagine, on this is why I don't drink coffee, by the way. I don't drink any coffee. Okay. Um, it magnifies the It chip. just makes it bigger, yeah. I mean, for me, you know, uh, it, that whole situation of seeing where I go with the rage, and then I see this again, I see you know, that, that rage hurts you and puts right. you three steps back. Listen, you gotta control that rage. Right. But it's a good thing that you have this rage. Because if we can take this, you know, 97 octane fuel and we put it in the right engine, right. controlled, oh my gosh. So we need to make sure that high octane is controlled because high octane in the wrong place can blow up a building. Yeah, and how do you go about controlling that? Because when I hear of someone a chip on my shoulder, you kind of think someone that wants to fight. And then what happens is you get caught up in the fight yeah. and not the result. I'm gonna beat that guy, you're not gonna say that about me, and that's a short-term thinking. Yes. How do you control that? You know, uh, so for me, um, here's what happened, and I'll give you the perfect example. So I had this conversation with our guys the other day. I said, look, there's nothing wrong with being very competitive. I said, but as competitive as you are, it's got a limit to it. What do you mean? Let me explain to you what I mean by this. So it's very good when you're coming up and there's competition because someone's making you feel inferior so you have to step up or you flight, right? You fight, flight, you freeze. Oh my gosh, he's better than me. I'm not gonna do anything. I can't beat this guy and boom, you just become a regular guy. Or you know, you flight, oh, I'm not gonna do this business, you know, whatever, and secretly you're not doing it because you know the other guy is better than you. So why am I gonna stay in this space? I'm just gonna leave this space. Yeah. Or you decide to go fight and see how you do. Okay, so if we go fight. I mean, if it's just a direct competition that you do, there's a limit. Eventually, you get to a point where you say to yourself, I think I can compete. Like we were about to shut down the channel in the first two years. And we said, I don't know if this is gonna be me. I don't know if the audience resonates. Maybe we just don't have it. Then we said, let's change the channel. Let's go from Patrick by David to calling it Valuetainment. So then we changed the channel to Valuetainment. We took a completely different approach because a lot of people want to brand names. I don't want a brand name. When I die, my name is only worth the legacy. I want to brand a business because I can sell that business hmm. is what I want to do. It's a completely different approach. Some people agree, some people don't. So I said, let's do Valuetainment. Why? We're bringing value, we're entertaining, and it's becoming a movement. So let's see how this resonates. Then we adjusted, then it started growing. Then we could compete, then we started growing, then it was no longer about the competition. Not because we're beating the competition, because PewDiePie is killing everybody, 69 million subs. So if you're really gonna compete, you're gonna get your ass handed to you. So guy, guy at the top's got 69 million. What are you gonna do to get to 69 million? Then maturity for me, and this happened at around 33, 34, 35, the main, main outcome became capacity. That's what it became. And I realized everyone's capacity is different in life. Your capacity may be higher in life, but you became an underachiever even though you have a lot more potential than I do. My capacity may be smaller in life, but I become an overachiever at my smaller capacity and I do better in life. Mm -hmm. You could even be an achiever and you still do good in life and you beat somebody who let's just say is not as talented than you, like let's just say yourself, you're an MIT guy, you're all this stuff. People are expecting you to win. So some of the kids you went to school with, if you just competed with those guys, that's like an 18 year old kid bullying a 14 year old, you're gonna beat them. It's not fair to compete there, mm -hmm. right? So on the outside, we can very easily fool ourselves into thinking we're winning because we're always comparing down versus if I compare to my capacity, I'm striving for something else, you know? So uh, once that chip went towards Pat, here's what we're really fighting for. If this is really your capacity, and if you constantly look at the marketplace about competition, and eventually, let's just say you beat a few people, then what? That doesn't necessarily mean you became, reached that level of capacity. I'm striving for this. That adjustment in that mindset, believe it or not, helped me have better relationship with other people, helped me have better relationship with competitors, because it's not about me against you. It's about PBD against PBD's capacity and I'm chasing this. And it gave a lot more peace, joy, uh, uh, comfort, not in a comfortable level, but comfort knowing, you know, we're playing a different game now. Yeah, some of my greatest guests on this show compete with themselves, including Dorian Yates, you know, and he was the guy that always wanted to beat himself. And I think that's why he got to those levels, because it wasn't about that guy or that guy, which also brings weird energy and weird results to the people around you. If you're trying to be the best version of yourself every day, that's how I think you get to greatness. And that sounds like what you're trying to do. I mean, Dorian Yates, I met Dorian Yates in 1999. 
Oh, wow. Let me tell you, I mean, when I saw Dory, and I have a picture with him and I at Venice Beach, okay? okay. And you'll see this 18-year-old guy that got out of the army. It was 1999, a 21-year-old guy that got out of the army. And I'm like, I'm going I'm to go be Mr. Olympia. That's what I'm thinking to myself. And I see Dorian Yates. And that's a perfect example of a guy that, I mean, his back, the way he built his back, he could pretty much fly. If he jumped off a building and just did a lat spray, that guy could probably fly in the middle of the sky with the way he built his back. Yeah, great story with Dorian Yates. By the way, props to you on that interview. That was an incredible interview. And you were able to take that, uh, the topic deep in areas that not a lot of people take in that space. And I think it was necessary. Somebody needed to do it. And so you spearhead that topic of steroids and growth hormone. And he went there, which is yeah. respect to him as well, yeah. uh, for willing to be open about it. Yeah, it was great to have him there. We were right place, right time. What do they say? The, the, the harder you practice, the more lucky you get. Yes. You know? And so we were there you know, right when that happened. Um, tell me more about Valuetainment, because I think from the outside, on the first look, people see it as, okay, simple lessons I can learn if I wanna be an entrepreneur. But what I see from you is a guy going through a lot of introspection and asking people to look down deeper inside yourself and saying, okay, what do I really want? What are my core values? What do I have to do to get myself out of these bad patterns, to get that Ferrari, to get that business? And you talked about this time where you went to Malibu Beach and you asked yourself questions. And I've never heard anyone talk about this. And you're sitting there alone asking yourself questions and really digging deep down into your soul as a way to get you to the next level in life and business. And it's not what you'd expect from a guy trying to teach entrepreneurs. Can you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, um, it's, a ver- it's very emotional. It's very emotional because your life is a, a, a combination of different events you've witnessed. Like, you know, there's a part of it that's our DNA, right? Let's just say, from the moment you're born, like I have my three kids, from the moment they were born, their DNA's been the same. Like the middle one was a charmer. From day one, he was a charmer. Like his teachers would say, he was two years old, I can't discipline your son because he just gives me the smile and I have to give him what he wants, yeah. right? And my oldest one was always a thinker. and observant and very creative and he liked vampires and scaring people and he liked to talk about sharks and he liked scary movies and my young one we never told her to pick stuff up or help her brothers out or bring the shoes to me that's dna i don't think that's like parents can take credit let me tell you the kind of kids i raise you know i don't think that's what it is so we have a dna right that's our thumb that's our fingerprint that we have in the world but then outside of that there's experiences there's trials, there's memories of mom and dad fighting, there's words mom said, there's words dad said, there's words a friend said, there's a breakup, heartbreak, setback, something the teacher said, a, a injury in sports, you were coming up, you almost made it to the next level, and your knee or your back or you got knocked out publicly in front of your peers and everybody saw you getting knocked out or an embarrassing moment publicly that happened that's still with you, you're still carrying it. You know, your girl left you for somebody else, your husband left you, your boyfriend left you, all of these things we carry, and we're pretty good at acting on the outside that we have everything under control, but we're afraid of facing this. So we avoid a lot of these situations. So for me that one day, I got a set, a set of these questions and I said, I'm gonna go and address these questions. I went to Malibu Beach, Beach it's right off Zuma, and uh, uh, Matador is what it's called. And I sat there and went through all these questions, six hours, I'm up right on the water. And I tell you, Brian, I was like writing it down and I would go to this moment. And I just, I'd never done this before. And I start writing it. And I start writing it. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I just start crying. I'm like, oh, come on, knock it off, you little crybaby. More, more, deeper, deeper, deeper. Why? How has this affected your life? Maybe this is the reason why you keep dating the same type of girls. Maybe this is the reason why the same types of people don't get along with you. Maybe this is the reason why you don't like these types of people because this. And then all of a sudden, I'm looking at this thing. Oh my gosh. If you go like this, you're going to be a monster, kid. We gotta figure this out. And so then there was a, almost a moment of liberation saying, look, you know, this is okay. This is your product, this is who you are. Now we gotta take some of this stuff and know the trends that's happened and be self-aware to know that the next time this happens, it's not the person's fault. You're looking at this person and you're thinking this person's your ex or your mom or your dad. It's not, it's that situation. This doesn't make it right. It just means something you experience. Give the person an opportunity. So it helped me go deeper in relationships rather than being, I was a very private guy, I don't let people in. Like most people, that I would date a girl and you had no idea I was with her for three years. People had no idea I had a girlfriend, private. I had girlfriends, people wouldn't know, what's, what's Pat up to, who does he date? Nobody knew. Right. Like one time I was with a girl in a company and I, we would go all the place, nobody knew her and I were together 
Finally, all of a sudden, one person finds out three years later, how did that happen? I said, how did you find out? So it was very private to me. And then that made me, with the help of social media, realize we're all naked today. I'm naked, you're naked, everybody's naked. I need five minutes to, on social media to find out your political beliefs. Do you like Trump? Do you like Hillary? Do you like uh, Merkel? Do you like uh, the prime minister of here? Do you like political? Are you gun? Are you anti-gun? Are you, you know, weed, legalized? It's very easy to figure out people nowadays because we're all naked. Mm -hmm. I can find that if you're married, complicated relationship, broken up, you know, what everything is naked. So rather than trying to fight it, we have to embrace it today. We got to figure out a way to embrace it today. And if you're not only embarrassed of who you are in a naked world, it's a very, very difficult life you're going to live. It's going to be a very difficult life for the rest of your life because the world's naked and you're trying to cover yourself up and everybody can see you. So we're almost forced to become a little bit more open, vulnerable, and say, this is who we are. One time I was on a flight coming back. Oh, my gosh. I'm not engaged yet. And they're wondering, you know, when is Pat going to propose to his girl? I said, I'm just not right. I keep fighting it off. I keep pushing my uh, girlfriend away at that time. I'm like, no, you, you can't handle being a guy like me. You just can't. And, you know, there, you, there's no way in the world you could be with a guy like me. And then on one flight, I write down all these. And why are you pushing her away? This could actually be a good wife. This could actually be a good mother. Why are you putting? And I wrote all these things down. I came back and I hid it in my uh, briefcase. And uh, one day, when I'm cleaning up my briefcase, I forgot the envelope and I left it there. And my wife read it. So I come home and she's crying. I said, why are you crying? She said, baby, I'm so sorry. I, I, I want you to know I'm, I don't want to pressure you. Don't worry about it. Whenever you're ready, I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, what's going on here? And I see the yellow notepad paper, three of them folded. And I'm like, please tell me you didn't read that. She says, no, I read it. And, you know, I'm sorry I did this, but I just was sitting there and I understand you so much better now, and I love you, baby. I don't care what happens. I'm like, oh, my gosh. So the reaction I thought was going to come was a complete opposite reaction. Mm -hmm. It got us deeper. Right. It helped the relationship get deeper. Which so, showed you you need to be more open about who you, you are. You do. You do. Because, listen, if, I don't know if my marriage is going to work out or not. You know, everybody asks me, so how's your marriage going? So, listen, I, we take it one year at a time. Marriage is not an easy thing. It's mm -hmm. very difficult. Mm -hmm. It's very complicated because... You know, you got a hard time getting along with yourself, let alone I got to get along with another person here. Are you kidding me? Throw some kids in there. And throw three kids in there. I mean, that's like a nuclear bomb possibly about to happen, right? So, but, uh, you know, best friendships, best relationships, you got to get deeper. And the deeper you get and more comfortable you are with you, your upside gets bigger and you actually get a chance to enjoy the ride rather than trying to act like somebody else the rest of your life. This is who Patrick with David is. I am very comfortable with who I am. Right, and constantly examining yourself is how you try to get to the next level. And you, you I mean, you're kind of like Jocko Willing, taking extreme ownership of what's happened in your life. Why do I keep attracting these women, these types of business partnerships? Why do I keep getting screwed over in deals or passed over? It's their fault, and then you're like, wait a second, maybe it's my fault. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty advanced way of looking at things. No doubt about it, no doubt about it. It's very hard to go there because, you know, I was having a conference call uh, on my flight out to London, with this couple and we were speaking and, and I said, look, this is the fourth time we're speaking in the last two years where the same things happened to you guys the last two years. I'm gonna be very gentle with the feedback I'm gonna give you, but here's also where I'm at. Every single time I've spoken to you guys the last three, uh, two years when this has happened, your response always been somebody else's fault. And I'm hoping you use this and this becomes the most painful experience for you where you're finally willing to take full responsibility and we move on. And so, again, push back, push back, push back, push back. I said, guys, I can't help you. We, can, we need to get off the call. And then there was a breakthrough. You know what? You're right. We messed up. Let us get better at this. Da, 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 da. I said, okay, saying it is different than doing it. Let's see what you guys are going to do. Because, you know, you create, you work so hard to create momentum. You know, and I told her, I said, I, said, I want you to explain it this way. I want to explain it to you in a different way when you think about business-wise. I said, think about it this way. I said... If you and your husband, you guys have been married how many years? She says, this many years. I said, think about how many minutes in the day. Think about how many hours in a day. Think about how many days in a year. You've been married 10 years, okay? Imagine if your husband does everything right in this 50,000 hours of you guys being together, okay? But just two minutes of it, he sleeps with a girl. How much influence does that two minutes have over the other 50,000 hours that he's done everything right with you? She says, everything. I said, that's how it is dealing with people. 
All it takes is two minutes to screw it up. So you got to realize when you're dealing with people, that two minutes, you can't just slip and say, oh my gosh, you know, you're, I'm not perfect, you got to forgive me. I said, no, some of the things that you do, it's going to hurt people. Mm-hmm. You got to kind of control yourself a little bit more. And she said, I never thought about it that way. I said, so moving forward, start thinking about it that way. Maybe you'll treat the people you're working with slightly different because everybody's sensitive in their own ways. Your approach has got to change. Fine. Tell me about entrepreneurship. What do most people not even understand about entrepreneurship? What does the 20-year-old out there who wants to be one not really know about what it really means to be that person? It's, it's, um, it's, um, (laughs) social media makes it nicer than it is. I'm going to tell you. You know, all these posts and motivation on the cars and the girls and the Ferraris and the Lambos and the planes and the jets. And by the way, here's what you got to realize. I'm all for it. Like people who say, well, you shouldn't buy exotic, I'm not, I'm not for that mindset. If you don't like it, no problem. If you do like it, no problem. I don't judge you. Whatever drives you, you go get it. For me, I drive a $406,000 car because in Iran, I would go to Shah's museum and he had Rolls Royce. And I said, one day I'd like to have a Rolls Royce. Great. So we're here. We're talking to the Rolls Royce community. We're doing a, a collaboration together with them. And uh, so I wanted to get a Rolls Royce because it connects me. Every time I'm in the car, Shaw comes to my mind. I have a painting of Shaw on my wall. I like that. But the game of entrepreneurship is so ugly that if people actually knew how ugly was up front, very few would even do it. It's very ugly. It's very lonely. Uh, it's very frustrating. It exploits you at the highest level. You know, you, you, in, the, in the world of business, you don't just have one or two weaknesses. Imagine all of a sudden one day, 50 weaknesses are exposed all at the same time. And everybody tells you because it's you. Who wants that? No one wants that. And imagine a game where you always have to recreate yourself or else you lose. Like, let me put it to you this way. It's like working out, but you can't take a day off. You know how you work out, at least you got like a few days off to have your, you know, regroup and all that stuff. For the first two to five years, you know, if you, if you look the other way, just because you just made a million dollars in a month and you start getting very cocky or arrogant, boom, you're wiped out. That's all it takes. It's a subtle look away to get knocked out. And so, you know, it, it's, it, it, a lot of these books, self-help books that you read and say, like, oh, you got to do this and you got to do this and you got to do that. They don't touch on the ugly part of running a business. Now, set the ugly part aside. The one part that outweighs being willing to tolerate all this pain is the fact that choices matters to you. If you're driven by choices, if you're driven by control, if you're driven by, you know, being able to choose the kind of a life you want to live, that reward is so much higher than the pain you're going to have to put up that you're willing to put up with the pain because you want this. Because what's the flip side? Here's the flip side. My three kids go to the same private school together. It's very expensive. Okay, you live in a decent community. You have a house with elevators and privacy. You can have security, you can have nicer insurance, nicer protection, better advisors, better counselors, better money managers, better attorneys, better CPAs, better protection, all of that stuff. The choices, better places to go, people that you can associate with that are at your same level, if not higher than you, more things that you can have as choice. I'm not talking necessarily material things, choices. So if the choices and the controls that big of a motivation for you, you know, you're going to be able to put up with the pain. But if the pain's too much for you and this doesn't really matter, you'll eventually go back to having a job. So you think people are oversold right now on entrepreneurs oh because of social media? But I tell you, we're oversold on everything. We're oversold <laughs> on marriage. We're oversold on having kids. We're oversold on entrepreneurship. I am that we are oversold on having kids. We are, I, don't, I don't know how many 21-year-olds I hear saying, I, I feel like if I have a kid, my life will change. Yes, it will change. Maybe not for the best. You know, maybe you got to take your time. I feel like I love her and the way I can show her I love her is by getting married. I don't know about that. You know, I don't know if today's the time to get married at 22. I'm being very serious with you. Yeah. I mean, look, you and I, imagine being 18 years old with access to Tinder. Imagine being, two, I, don't, we don't, I don't know that. I don't know what it is to swipe left, swipe left, swipe left, swipe left. Oh, let's go, beer, great. You want to go hook up? Let's go in the back of the car. I mean, this has become very normal. So sex has become a very, uh, hey, I, we kissed. You know, oh, it's cool. Hey, uh, um, yeah, three girls this week. How? Where did you meet them? Oh, Tinder, swipe left, swipe right. What are you talking about? So 
where the value of that used to be more, it's not the same value as it is today because it's easier access today than it was before. So you got to question marriage too early. You got to actually ask, why do you want to get married? Why do you want to have kids? Why do you want to be an entrepreneur? And the answer has to be very crystal clear. It's not just because, like, I have an answer on why I wanted to have kids. And I had to get very clear before I wanted to have kids. Most of us have kids because everybody's having kids. So it's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to get married. You're supposed to do this. And I think the, the, the fact that with entrepreneurship, you know, don't let the lifestyle fool you. I mean, this is, it takes a lot of work. And you have to ask yourself the question, are you really willing to go through it? If yes, Chris, here's the one thing I do advise to Brian, to everybody. I think everybody ought to run a part-time business. Affiliate marketing, great. Sell products on the side, garage, you know, uh, uh, whatever it is, get your real estate license, sell real estate on the side, get an insurance license, sell insurance on the side, and maintain your job. And put 10 or 15 hours into it. I think everybody ought to do it and can do it. Everybody. So, but the word of entrepreneurs, multidimensional. At what level do you want to go? I mean, do you want to go building a business doing 50 grand a year? Great. Go do it. Everybody ought to do it. Do you want to build a business doing a million dollars a year? Well, maybe not everybody can. You can build a million dollar your business. 10 million is the interesting number because very few get to the 10 million. One of five, a lot of people get stuck to one of five. 10 is, you know, difficult. Um, then from 10, do you want to do $100 million? Do you want to get to a billion? I mean, the game changes at that point, right? But the, the, the more clear you are on your outcome of everything you do in life, kids, wife, business, career, friendship, spiritual, exercise, the more clear those outcomes are, the more fluid the, the action is going to be taken because you know why you're doing it. And so, yes, I think today social media fools the reality of being an entrepreneur. Do you think you do the same by putting out the videos or do you try to make it clear with people that, look, this is taking work? Oh, I make it clear that it's work. I make it clear that it's pain. Uh, but I, I, I try to sell the reward uh, and I try to sell the idea of it has to matter to you. You know, like what you do here with creating content, Think about how many people started a podcast and they had potential, but they stopped. Yeah. Think about it. Yeah. Think about how much work it takes to run a podcast, okay? You, you have a wife, you have a kid, you have a business, you have all these other things. Think about the effort it takes. Think about the discipline. Think about the level of consistency to find a guest, to interview, to questions, to research, to content. To All, all this stuff takes a lot of effort, right? But you're doing it. It's very obvious you're enjoying it, and it matters to you. And that's why you're effective, if that makes any sense. Yeah. You see some people that are, it doesn't matter to them, they're winging it. So that's the differentiator between an amateur and a pro. A pro is trying to figure out a way to be prolific because it matters to them. So the one thing with Valuetainment that you get is, you will hear me talk, hear me talk about clarity and it mattering to you so many times. Because if it does, the world better get out of your way because you're going to get what you want at whatever level you want. Right. You weren't always a fan of capitalism, but you switched and now believe it is the solution. And there was a point where your dad was going through series of operations and series of operations mm -hmm. and you realized that you didn't have the choice and that you had to rely on other people to take care of them. Is that what turned the switch with you? Because yeah, like my, I, my, my, my body, every time I go there, my body just... Uh, yeah, I mean, listen, when that happened that day and, and he says, you're not paying for this, the government, the taxpayers are paying for this. You know, my dad's in a hospital having a heart attack, he had his 13th heart attack, and I'm looking at the same. You know, if this man dies, I never met my grandpa. My kids have to know their grandpa, and that's my dad. So that was a very emotional moment. Oh, for you. my gosh. I mean, if you've seen the movie Life of an Entrepreneur uh, with the Ferrari, not the movie, the short clip with my hand on the steering wheel and I'm going like yeah. this, that's not an act. That happened in my Ford Focus, right in front of Ucilia Medical Center. So that's why it's, it, that was a very emotional moment for me. When I'm sitting down there saying, man, Pat, you are chasing girls, you are partying, you are so worried about becoming cool at the nightclubs and being good at the party scene. And meanwhile, your dad's having a heart attack, stressed out over money, is not traveling the world, he's worried about you all the time, why don't you go do something about your life and be productive? And boom, that changed. But I was still not a capitalist. And I didn't know what it really meant. I just knew rich people were greedy. But at the same time, I had this conflicting debate in my, in my brain, in my mind. I w we would visit this uncle. His name was Luther Lazar. Very interesting. <laughs> it's a cool name. <laughs> okay. He's a Syrian, okay? Okay. And You're half a Syrian. I'm half a Syrian, yeah. yes. So we would, we, in Iran, he had a bagh, which bagh, I don't know how to say what a bagh is. It's like a, 
a, a place where it's uh, lots of, it's like, not like a farm, but anyway, it's like a bog, fruits, pool, acres and acres of land, and we would go there. And he had this property, and every year people would show up, a couple hundred people would show up, we'd have such a good time. And then he left Iran. He went to U.S. and, uh, you know, started getting into business. He had this house that was 7,200 square feet on San Antonio Avenue in the cul-de-sac right next to Snoop Dogg, okay? And Snoop was famous for putting big parties in Upland back in the days. I'm sure he still does, but at that time he was famous, infamous about it. So we go to his house, and I remember, Brian, I remember what the house looked like. He had a big bird nest outside when he entered the house, okay? Always had a bunch of Jaguars because that was his cars. Putting green, you go to the house, you enter, library to the right, his office, big living room, his bedroom with a jacuzzi right there for he and his wife. To the left was the kitchen where everybody was always at. Then you'd go around with a pool table, his picture with his family, all dressed in white, and a picture with Al Gore, him shaking hands, and he would sit there and he would do the following with everybody. He would say, uh, so, you know, I, I read the Bible and I read this opposite our argument and the guy says that the Bible has a contradiction because of this. And his kids would sit there who went to Christian school and they would say, Dad, you're wrong. The guy has no clue what he's talking about. And then all of a sudden he switches and he said, you know, this other guy said that Michael Jordan's the greatest, but what about Magic Johnson? He made other people better. And look at the people. I don't think, and he would always have his kids debate. So weird. Hmm. Everybody's debating at the dinner table. So then I noticed this dynamic, like this guy's making people smarter because an argument is making people say, well, I have an opinion. And they were going back and I just sit there like a kid, 14 years old, and I watch this guy, tennis court in the back, backyard with a pool and a changing area and all these fruits that he had and a guest room for his family to stay when they would come at the 7,200 square foot place. And that was my only example of success I had from capitalism. My dad was a 99 cent store cashier. My mother was a stay home. We were a welfare family with you know, uh, uh, food stamps and all this other stuff. And so one day I said, you know, I don't know if my mom's right about this rich person. I don't know, but I'm going to go figure it out for myself. Then I got into the marketplace. Insecure, low self-esteem. Everybody I would work with said, well, that guy's going to win because he has a JD. He went to school. He worked for attorney general. That guy's going to win because he worked at Raytheon. He has a degree from Santa Barbara, USC, UCLA. You don't have anything. You're not going to be able to compete in the marketplace. Then when I won and I started beating a lot of these guys I was going against that I was afraid of, I realize free market capitalism works. And if here's a kid that's insecure, low self-esteem, not the smartest guy in the room, but he's willing to outwork, outimprove, outlast, outstrategize, he's got a shot in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And then I became an advocate. And so a lot of times I work with the guys and they'll say, well, I don't know about capitalism because it's about the rich people. And every single time I have a big bonus to pay somebody who doesn't believe in capitalism, here's what I always say, I'll call him up. I had this one guy call him up and I say, Hey, uh, I won't say his name because, you know, I said, hey, how you doing? Good. Well, listen, I got a bonus check for you. And it's a good size bonus check. Oh, no way. Yeah, it's a very good, nice bonus check. But look, this is what I wanted to do. One of the things I respect about you a lot and I like about you a lot is how amazing you are at how much you care about the people who need money. He says, yeah, I do. I said, and, you know, and I sometimes I sit and I, I wonder, like, maybe you're right about capitalism, that the capitalist shouldn't get all the money that he should redistribute some of the wealth. He says, yeah, Pat, I've been telling you this for years. I said, that's exactly why your $20,000 check, what I'm doing with your $20,000 check is, instead of giving you the 20,000, you're one person, why would I give you 20,000? I'm gonna give 1,000 to your top 20 people and give them $1,000 and I'm gonna let them know, you believe in redistribution of wealth and I'm gonna give you a bunch of love. Wait, 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 wait. I said, what do you mean wait? He says, no, no, I don't want you to do that. I said, what do you mean you don't want me to do that? Well, I worked hard for that. I said, I agree. That's why this is your $20,000 check. So the next time you question capitalism, don't forget, not everybody's willing to work as hard as you to get this $20,000 check. And if they did, they could get it as well. Enjoy the money with your family. I got it, Pat, I got your point. So, you know, it's so very- we're all, we're all capitalists Oh, uh, Everybody is. You know, yesterday I'm speaking to uh, 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 Katie Hopkins, who I realized is not, admire, is not loved by everybody in, in uh, London and UK here. And she said something to me about uh, how a point system. And so she says, I like the Australia uh, system for immigration. If somebody wants to come to UK, why don't we use a system that's used in Australia, which means if you have a career, you get a point. If you have this, you get a point. If you have this, you get a point. And then I said, okay, great. Let's just say we use the point system and I'm trying to push her with this topic. And I said, let's just say out of the point system, you know, 400,000 Muslims want to come to UK. 
and they score at the highest level for your point system. Are you okay if 400 Muslims that scored high on your point system come to UK? Well, no, no, no. I said, why not? She said, well, because you know, it also, yes, you also have to love UK. I said, but how are you going to know if anybody loves UK? I mean, you can't really gate somebody. Anybody can say, I love you, and I don't love you. I'm just saying it because I'm trying to, you know, men are famous for saying I love you to a woman just to have, you know, five minutes of fun. I said, what do you think? Someone's not going to say I love you, okay? Well, no, I don't know about that. I said, so is it the fact that you're concerned because a religion is outcompeting another religion because they're better marketers? He says, uh, well, I never thought about it that way before. I said, maybe if we believe in capitalism like you do, Maybe you also got to let the religions compete to see who's going to get the most people getting baptized. And you and I can't control that. Maybe Christians ought to learn something about this. Maybe they're not as competitive as some other people are. And they're getting a bigger share of the marketplace. I spoke to a group of pastors. And for an hour and a half, I called them up. I said, you guys are terrible in marketing. You're good at sales. The last best marketer you had was Billy Graham. You guys are good at getting up there and giving your message. But with the access to social media, all this other stuff, maybe you guys ought to study what the LDS church is doing with marketing because they're probably the best at marketing and some of these other religions. The point is this, capitalism is not, I say this because you said we're all capitalists. Capitalism isn't just about money. There's a pretty girl that every guy wants to be with and she makes a great wife. She doesn't necessarily, not every pretty girl marries the best looking guy. She marries the guy that gave the best proposition and sold her That's a form of capitalism. A guy who gets that girl is a better capitalist than the other guy. The same goes with faith. The same goes with business. The same goes with influence. The same goes with everything. Everybody's fighting and the best in the marketplace survive. Right. And on that note of sales, you try to get people over the fact that they say, I'm not a salesperson. I don't want to be a salesperson. Oh, no doubt about it. Because in your mind, everyone is. Everybody is. Oh my gosh, everybody is. Yeah, I mean, I had a guy that uh, he would tell me, yeah, I'm never going to get into real estate. I said, you should go to real estate. I mean, you're in a great market. No, I'm not a salesperson. I said, you're not a salesperson. I said, do you realize I went to nightclubs with you? I saw how you spoke to women. Buddy, you're as best as they get. No, 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 but that's a different. I said, it's not different. That's persuading somebody to want to give a piece of them to you. That's even harder than selling a real estate property. And he says, no, it's a difference. I said, no, buddy. I said, you forget it. You, you're, you're great in sales, but you may be secretly lazy and nobody knows about it mm-hmm. because sales is going to require a lot of work. But the ability to sell, we're all selling all the time. And we need to, get, we need to admit that to ourselves. Uh, abs- and by the way, in any business you're in, it, this isn't just about the guy that's in real estate or insurance or pharmaceutical sales. In any industry you're in, you have to realize you're selling in anything. Uh, even the lawyer, the accountant, the customer service rep, all of it, you're selling all the time. Right. Tell me about immigrating to the U.S. Tell me what it was like growing up in Iran. You, you, you know, you're, you, were, you were raised, it seems like, uh, you know, you're a, you're a tough guy. You know, you were probably raised to be a hard guy. Is that because of those experiences? Is that as an Iranian thing or is that your parents and, and, and siblings? Yeah, so, it, well, I have an older sister, so I'm the younger child of the family. and She's five years and ten months older than me. But... You know, when you see a lot of things, not a lot of things, you know, scares you. You know, when you, when you encounter getting close to death, I think uh, uh, one of the authors wrote about this, uh, David and Goliath, not David versus Goliath, who wrote it? Uh, he's one of these big authors, excellent book. And he says they did a research on people who got bombed on and they didn't die, okay? or people who had a close call and they didn't die, and what happened to them. And he explains how they went into uh, two different drastic places. Mm. Either they went to a place of extreme disastrous follow-up with bad things where they didn't do anything crazy with their lives, or they went to, maybe there's a bigger reason why I'm here, okay? Maybe there's a bigger purpose of my life here. You know, living in Iran and you're seeing 10,000 men march and they're flagellating their back with a streak of blood at eight years old, that's going to stay with you. It's not going away. Yeah. You know, living in Iran and seeing your dad constantly having to tape X on the windows in your bedroom because every time they would bomb, it would shatter and the glass would drop and they always taught you on TV to make sure you taped up the place because if you taped it, it drops right there. If you don't, it just goes out. 
okay, I mean, that's a visual that stays, you know? When you go outside and you go to the park they used to play and now there's a big hole out there and from a bomb that was dropped, that stays. When you're driving over a bridge in Iran, Tehran, and you're going to a city called Karaj, and the bridge behind you, 50, 100 yards behind you, a bomb drops and it goes down and your dad tells you not to look back and you look back and you see that, that doesn't go away. Those things don't go away. So for me, extreme paranoia, extreme discomfort, extreme anxiety, extreme worry, extreme panic, it was always like, today's the last day, today's the last day, today's the last day, today's the last day. And there was a, a scene one time where uh, we were in war and this alarm comes up in Iran. And it says, Tabajo, uh, Tabajo, Alamat Kermez. It's like, warning, warning. The sign the, of red sign is showing that somebody has flown over our border. So expect for something to happen. And the moment that would happen, everybody's running. And we were always told to go under the stairs. So if the stairs are here, you would always come and hide right here. So we went down the stairs and all we're hearing is the whistles. Pause, three, two, one, boom. And you would see another one and you would see boom, boom, and then boom, boom, which means the plane kind of flew over you. Wow. And it's getting closer and it's going up. And all I was doing was looking at my dad. I gotta give my dad a lot of credit. I was looking at my dad, I'm like, man, this guy. And he said, it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. He never cried, he never flinched. I'm like, if he's not worried, I'm not worried. So that was a sign of leadership that if you show fear, your people will be afraid. You can't show it, he didn't show it. And I know he was afraid. I mean, what are you gonna do? You got your two kids and a wife. And so from there going to Germany, refugee camp, and um, you know, experiencing with other people, and the first time I got stabbed was at the refugee camp, and then coming here, not a lot of stuff throws you off right. at that point, you know? Not a lot of things gets to you where you sit there and say, oh my gosh, how do you handle this? How do you do that? So that kind of helps you out in that sense. But as far as the toughness goes, being raised in Iran gave me so much gratitude for what we have today in America. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. Talk to me about mentors, because you have kind of a trifecta strategy. And you know, everybody always wants to ask me about mentors and people that they've seen on the show. And you know, uh, I think you have a good way of looking at it. And so how do you do it? And and do you have mentors? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, there's three levels of mentorship, right? You have uh, those that are theory. And what I mean by theory is somebody who's read a lot of books and gives you the theories they read based on books. My uncle was a uh, level one mentor. He had read so many books on physics, on everything. He was so well read in Iran. Maybe read 5,000 books. This guy named Johnny was a genius but he never did anything, but he always shared the theories. Well, let me tell you what Nietzsche said. Let me tell you what this guy said. Let me tell you what that guy said. Let me tell you what this guy said. And I was great. It's still educational, yeah. but it's level one, right? Then the second level is uh, experience, meaning I can learn more about you by talking to Ruth and by talking to the people around you than actually talking about talking to you. Like if I wanna learn about you, I don't talk to you. I go talk to your people. Hmm. I said, so tell me how is he with this? What happens when friction takes place? How does he respond to that? They'll give me a better perspective than you would. Because you still have some kind, we, we, if you ask me, there's still gonna be some things I'm probably not gonna see that they're gonna see, that they pay attention to, but they never bring up to my attention. So say Guy Kawasaki worked directly with Steve Jobs. We learn about Steve Jobs through him. Hmm. It's kinda like, wow, that's how Steve was. One time in a meeting, Steve did this. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. And we believe him because he witnessed somebody else. And then the last one is application, which to me is the highest one. Application is somebody that tells you, listen, when we ran our first business and I went out of business, this is the mistake I made. On the second time when I did this, I raised this money and I did this and we did $58 million in a year. My suggestion to you is when you're getting ready to make this decision, think twice about it and look for these three things. If that person doesn't meet it, don't even think about it and then hire this person. Great, I never thought about it that way. I need a COO, I need a CMO, I need a CFO, I need, perfect, thank you for that counsel. That person is a trifecta because he's given theories, experience, and application all combined together. That to me is the highest level of mentor. And that's the one you want to spend time with and you want to search them out. Oh my gosh. For instance, my conversation with Michael Francis. I cannot tell you how much I learned from the guy by boardroom. I mean, I can't give it, I can't, I can't, I can't put a number on it. And when I speak to uh, 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 some of these guys, like I have a guy I work with, Greg, you know, who ran an insurance company, was a professional baseball player. His first pitch in MLB was to Pete Rose, 
and then went and worked for an insurance company for 30 years. His wife was with an insurance company for 22 years, Pack Life. And now he, I hired him as an ambassador for us, and his wife is now our COO. But listening to him talk, he finds blind spots, and I didn't see the blind spots. I'm like, interesting, I didn't think about this. Another guy, I have Greg, who's raised all this money. I mean, he has access to a couple billion dollars. If he wants to get money, he's, he's our guy that put the deal together with Oscar De La Hoya, Gabriel Brenner. He'll call me and he'll say, look, uh, I know you're about to make a big decision and you're the CEO and the chairman of the board. I want you to think about these three things before making that decision. When we were in the boardroom today, you said this, 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 that. You may want to reconsider that. Here's why. Read this email I sent to one of my former board members and I'll take out the name. I just want you to read the email and see the feedback I gave him. Interesting. I'll read it. Oh my gosh. What a big mistake. Great. I love that. Take a note. Next. So the more I have, like there's an insurance guy, his name is Mehran. He's the CEO of an insurance company called National Life Group. He and I had a big falling out back in 2009, very big falling out back in 2009. And uh, he runs a $4 billion company. He's grown his business to where it's at today. A lot of respect in the insurance business. The second time around, we had a meeting. It was a very awkward meeting when we had. We were in Orlando and we sat in this room. He had two of his associates that are hoping we strike a deal because they want our business. I have two of my associates sitting here. They're hoping I don't screw this up because they want to steal. But you should have seen he and I in that room. I mean, the level of intensity. Somebody would have thought we were going to get into a fight. It was personal. It was personal. He's thinking he made the right decision. I'm trying to say, you screwed up when we did this. And then finally, it was like, well, I screwed up partly. And look, here's what we did at that time because we were making this decision. Perfect. Today, when he and I go to lunch together, and he gives me counsel on being a CEO, I'm just like this the entire time. Hmm. I'm just like this. Hmm. It's like this. Every time we go anywhere, if we have a setting where we're there together, I'm sitting at a say, where are you sitting? I like to sit like this with him. Like next, uh, uh, in two weeks, for many years, insurance industry is famous for treating you well. So they'll take you for drinks, for restaurant, high-end places, all this other stuff. We decided to take a different route. And we do something that no one in our marketplace does, no one. These guys, no one ever does this for them. I said, listen, here's what we're gonna do. Once a year, you're coming, you're our guest. Okay, when you come to us, we're gonna put you at a hotel, best hotel in town, we're gonna take you to the best restaurant in town, we're gonna take the bill for drinks, for food, for everything, and we're gonna sit down and we're gonna give you gifts, we're gonna give you books, we're gonna give you items, and I'm gonna give you three hours presentation of exactly good, bad, and ugly we did this last year in the company, your counsel to us, our feedback to you, collaboration together, what can we do to go grow? First time I did this meeting, there's 16 people in the room. Everybody's looking at each other. When I used to talking like this, I said, and these are top, top executives, CEOs of major $400 billion companies, hard $100 billion companies. Everybody starts talking. I said, are you guys not used to this? No, we don't do things like this. We don't sit there and talk about things like this. Second time, everybody starts opening up, but they started getting close to it. Our next one's coming up this year. We're gonna have 28 people there, okay? Everybody is looking forward to this meeting. Why? I'm sitting there and I'm talking about our company's flaws and looking for their feedback. And the reason why I want their feedback is because they're trifectas in the room. Mm. So whatever feedback they give me, I'm sitting there saying, oh my goodness, thank you. Oh, this was great, perfect. We do need somebody like this. We do need somebody like that. And that's the, one of the reasons why 14 quarters in a row, we've written more life insurance policies this quarter than a quarter prior. 14 quarters in a row, that's three and a half years. Because now it's about counsel. Now it's about advisors. Now it's about mentors and setting aside the ego of who has to be right. It's about what's the best decision, not who has to be right. And we're, more, we're, see, we're solving more for the best possible decision than the best protection of the ego. This is proof of you getting the chip off your shoulder. Oh, no doubt. And this is me learning that I was a terrible CEO. Let me tell you, I was not a good CEO. I was a terrible CEO. Um, I, I, so, you know, transition of going from employee, you know, what's a good employee? Follow instructions, what they tell you, right? And show up on time, for the most part, right? Then you go into sales. It's different because no one's paying you a salary. You're not on a draw, you're commission, especially if it's commission. You'll learn about discipline. If you don't make it in sales because you like discipline, you gotta go back to having a job because somebody has to tell you what to do versus in the uh, sales world, you don't have to be told what to do. You're figuring out a way how to do it, right? And then three uh, is sales leader. So there's a lot of people that say things like, you know, a guy that was making 300 grand a year selling pharmaceutical sales, and he's great at it, 
but he sucks as a sales leader. And he says the following words, and you hear this all the time. They'll say things like, I'm just not a fan of babysitting people, man. Let me tell you, all these people are so lazy. What happened to this? Listen, listen, at one point you didn't have it either. So sales leader is very difficult because in order for you to make it in sales, you are now disciplined, but this person's not. And so you gotta pull this person up. Oh, psychologically, it's very difficult to do that. So okay, then I became a good sales leader. And then I became one of the best sales leaders. But I wasn't a business owner yet. So then you learn how to be a business owner because finances, CPA, taxes, audit, you know, all these rules, regulations you have to abide by. And if you don't, it's a headache and you know, audit, all these things you have to go through. So then I learned how to be a business owner. And the last level is a CEO. And uh, I had no idea how to be a CEO. No, no idea. I sucked in boardrooms. I was abrasive. I was rude. I was too aggressive. I negotiated too aggressively. I didn't realize how important of a role partners played. I was all about my sales guys and my customers and my employees. I treated vendors terribly. I treated carriers terribly. And I had to realize, in order, yes, sales is most important because if you take care of them, they're going to try to treat your customers good. Number two for me is home office staff because I treat home office good, they're going to treat salespeople good. Then it's clients. For me, it's different for everybody. Hmm. Then it's partners, then it's vendors. So I said, moving forward, we're going to treat our partners royally. And that's when it got deeper. And the next thing you know, carriers started advising me to sell a product with another carrier that's a competitor. Why are you doing that? Because Mm -hmm. there's a partnership now. So they now become an alliance because there's an alliance here, right? right? And so that was the maturity uh, uh, level I had to get through. And I tell you, it wasn't easy. It was very difficult because I screwed up so. If you go and interview the people that I work with on a daily basis that have been in some board meetings, and I told them, say whatever you want to say, and I'm not in the room. They're going to tell you some horror stories. They're going to tell you some embarrassing stories. Some of them are probably going to be like, why'd you share that with them? Well, you tell me to open up. But, you know, the, the process is a good process. It's always good to know, man. Yeah, I wonder what the 45-year-old version of Pat's going to look like as a CEO. I wonder what you're going to look like. That. That's a very, it's like a, it's like a movie that's never ending until you die. Yeah. What a great movie to watch to know what the next level is going to be like in life. So yes, growing as a CEO made a major difference in the business to learn how to control that ship. Right. And company culture, how do you maintain that your people really love you and love what they do and motivate them? Because that's a different level. You're right. It is. It is a different level. So for me, uh, company culture, it's very different with staff home office versus sales. Very different. Right? So how you treat employees at the lowest level versus how you treat directors versus how you treat executives versus how you treat salespeople, versus how you treat sales leaders, versus how you treat senior vice presidents or chairman's councils at the highest level. It's all different, right? And some of the things I do uh, initially didn't make a lot of sense, but I'll kind of give you a process on how it works. So first of all, employees, anybody that works with me, employees, I'm walking around, putting my hand, you know, shaking your hands, how you doing, hugging you, what's going on, how's this, Johnny, what's going on over here, hey, did you see the Lakers, hey, did you see what's going on with this with LeBron? So everybody there matters to me, from the front desk clerk to security to the newest employee making 15 bucks an hour. Our minimum wage at our home office is 15 bucks, which uh, 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 we did that in the state of Texas. Minimum wage is 720, we're paying 15. Not because of a social anything like that, but uh, for me, 15 bucks an hour times 40 hours in a week, 600, 600 times 52, you know, that's 31,200. It's, it's not a crazy lifestyle. 31,200, I have a hard time you know, convincing myself giving somebody 10 bucks an hour. So we chose to do 15 bucks. So everybody's happy to work there. We don't lose a lot of people. I used to be cheap on that side when we're coming up because you're trying to build your business. And then I realized, forget about the whole idea of, well, you know, uh, uh, if she doesn't want to be here, we'll find another person. Yes, that's partly right. But here's the interesting question to ask that changed all the dynamics for all of us. So let me ask you a question. How many hours have you put into her? A lot. How long? Pat, I can't even put, put it. How many things list right now that she can do within the business? What do you mean? Tell me what she can do. Well, she knows how to do this. How to go, keep going. How many things do you have right there? 45 things. You have to teach those 45 things to another person. So why don't we give her that $3 raise and let's just move on? Ah, but I don't want because that's like she wins. Because I know, just give it to her and we move on. Because if you don't, you're going to have to teach us 45 things to two, three other people. Do you want to go through it again? No. Well, then let's make this decision. Mm -hmm. So the processing changed on the way you viewed those things. So then it became employees that I have where I said, you know what? 
I don't want to negotiate your salary anymore. What do you mean? I don't want to have that awkward conversation with you anymore at all. What's your point? Who's the highest paid person in this industry right now? This, uh, like one guy sat down and said, what's the highest paid for your position, what you do, what's the highest paid? You take a month and go interview with everybody. He goes and pulls, I know the number. So he says, $120,000. I said, here's what we're doing. I'm gonna pay you 145, but I'm never negotiating again. You're never asking me for a raise again. Fair? You okay with that? Yes, great, here's 145. You really doing this? Yeah, but I'm telling you, you have to tell me we're not negotiating this again. Yes, let's move on. That's a different person because it was a person that I needed at the beginning. So then just yesterday, I moved up, I went up to one of my employees, executive, top three ranked people in the company. Uh, this was literally when I'm leaving on my flight to London, I went and sat down, you got five minutes? Yes. A uh, couple things, uh, you're getting this raise. What? Yeah, you're getting it for what? What you've done the last three months when we went through a crisis internally on the technology stuff that we were going through and you had to control it, I was so impressed that you're getting this raise. You're serious? Yeah. Where did this come from? It's not even an annual review. It's a surprise. It's not annual review. Well, I'm going to give you a raise. No, no. Here's what I'm doing. Oh, my. yes, you're a leader. I respect what you did. This is a pretty big raise. I know it is, but don't worry about it. We're moving on. This is what you Move on, okay? So that element is a different element of the culture you're creating. Fun, like here's one thing that's a little weird that uh, uh, some of my executives had a hard time when I said I'm not compromising this. Everybody at the home office is required to read a book a month or you're fired. Everybody. And the book you're supposed to read every month is the book I choose every month. You can read any other books you want. You can read romance novels all you want. But the one book I choose every month, we're all reading together. And then you're writing a paper about it. And then you're submitting it. And we have to explain this in our interview process nowadays. And most people are like, what do you mean? Every month you have to read a book or you're fired. That's very awkward for most people. And so they fought me on it. I said, I'm not compromising this. I'm just telling you guys I'm not doing this. So, well, Pat, you can't make people read on their off time. I'll pay them one hour every week on my dollar to be forced to read. Step away from your desk, go sit over there, and I have this whole nice lounge area, go sit there and read. I'm gonna pay for you. So I'm gonna pay four hours a month for you to read. And four hours is plenty of time on my money for you to read. So I'm paying you 60 bucks a month minimum for you to read versus some of you guys that get paid 100 bucks an hour, $400 to read on my time. You do that? Yes, and we announce it. What? Yes, you're supposed to read. So then all of a sudden, people who were just like nobodies and now are making money, and if you really recreate yourself, I give equity in the company. I, give, I love giving equity. Because if you want to, I'm not a profit sharing guy, I'm a more equity guy. So if I, especially being a startup, I have control over, I give you equity. Why equity? This is a part of you. You own this. This thing sells for a bill, this is going to be your payout. Wow, I never thought about it. Thank you so much. Every single time I've had a meeting about equity and I tell one of my employees, Mario was one of them. I sat him and I said, here's how many shares you're getting. He starts crying. This just happened 12 months ago, last year, in December when I had the meeting. Purely tears. I did it with another lady, Alexis, when she started working when she was in her early 20s, single mother, she was getting paid $400 a month from me. She was a part-time support for me. Now she's driving a 750 as a support out of our home office and she's got a couple kids, extremely happy, beautiful salary and she just became an equity. She cried for 15 minutes. For 15 minutes she cried. And I'm like, I am so happy for you, man. You've worked hard. Give me a hug. Boom. Next. So now let's go sales. Okay, let's go sales. Hmm. So sales is different than what I just explained, support. Support's different, sales is different. Okay, sales. We have a call-out environment. And a call-out environment is the following. If, if you run an office out of Chicago, and I run an office out of um, Tarzana, California, if I'm being distracted, you can call me out. So it's not like, hey, pal, let me tell you, that guy's doing something I'm not happy with. You want me to call him? Why don't you call him out? I'm not supposed to call him out. It's the issue you have with him. So either forget about it and don't bring it up again or call him directly. No problem. So everybody, through peer pressure, is solving issues together. We're a very big peer pressure environment. I love peer pressure. I love driving a company based on peer pressure. Which means competition and stats and... Yeah, a lot of competition, stats, but pride, alignment, culture, vision, crusade, cause, protection, loyalty. It's not just competition. I'm a data-driven business guy. Everything to me is data. If you come to our office, it's the analytics everywhere. Mm -hmm. We're doing a meeting here in the next two weeks. 
uh, at Palm Springs. I'll get a 28,000 square foot house and I'll fly in 150 people, 200 people. And for three and a half days, we're studying every single data. We start 8 a.m., we go till midnight. Every day, we do this. And we watch them. Every year I pick a movie and this year is gonna be a new movie I'll pick for them. And we'll watch the movie and I'll stop the movie and I'll look at this part. What'd you get take away from this? Here's the point, next, this part. So I have a movie I'm gonna watch with them this year, I'm pretty excited about, that's gonna be around a point I'm trying to make to them. I can't say it right now, because it's on live. What kind of movies do you it. usually watch? Uh, so, so we've watched Sting, when Sting was doing his song with Cheb Mame, Desert Rose. If you haven't seen this, Brian, it's sick. Okay, it's documentary about It's that. sick, it's documentary stuff. So he flies in all these incredible music, musicians from around the world. And for one week, they're staying at his house, and they're just fooling around. And they're just playing. And he tells a story about, I wanted to you know, write a song about longing, Desert Rose. And Cheb Mame does this line that he did, and he hadn't given it to anybody. And I said, what's this all about? He said, it's about longing. And then they're performing, and then 9-11 happens. Hmm. And Cheb Mame's Middle Eastern, and he felt bad. And they had a concert that they wanted to do something together, and they canceled, and Sting's crying. Oh, guys, I don't know what to do. I feel bad. I, I, I feel like I don't know. All these people are struggling in New York, in America, and we're over here in France, and you know wherever they were, and we're having this good time, and I feel bad about it. And then one guy, you see the one guy through, you know, crisis. One guy that's not even anybody, just a quiet guy in the documentary says, "But I think if we don't, the enemy's winning. We have to create. The enemy wants us not to create." Hmm. And he's struggling, struggling, and then they do the performance. And he does Englishman in New York. And he does these, you know, sting uh, fields of gold. And he does the whole desert rose outside with 100 people there. And you're just, I mean, you're just emotional. It is 10 times better than this album you buy. Because hmm. there's emotion in that performance, right? So we watched this together at a castle in Yucca Valley. And I had them watch this. And I said, guys, crisis is around the corner. Many of them. You guys got to realize, we're going to go through this. And in every situation like this, one of you guys is going to have to remind us to keep creating. And I'll let the enemy win. So that's one. Last year, we watched Trumpsters. We watched a documentary of Trump. Hmm. And my room is 50% Democrat, 50% Republican. Some people can't stand them. But I said, I don't want you to look at this. The story we're watching today is not about Trump. I want you to look at this from the story of his grandpa, not even his father, Fred. Look what his grandpa did. That was the entire outcome. Because the outcome is, look, most of you guys are immigrants. You're not gonna be a president. But think about what the grandfather did that set the pace for his grandson to be a president one day. What we're teaching you today with the culture of the company, one day your grandson or granddaughter could be the president of the United States. I want you to think about it that way. So it was a pure legacy approach. The year before we watched uh, uh, 84 Bears, and we watched 84 Bears about the dynamics of uh, uh, Mike Ditka and the defensive coordinator, uh, Buddy, who was supposed to be the head coach, but he didn't get the job, and it was the first time ever in Super Bowl where two people were held up, not just one guy was held up, and the, the challenges they went through and how they overcame it. It's always intentional. Okay. It's always an intentional movie we pick. You had Dick on your show as well, didn't you? Huh? You had Mike on your show. Yes, uh, we did. Yeah. We had Mike on the show and, yeah. and his wife, which was... Uh, so you're planting these little seeds into your team's head and saying, okay, let's look at this, let's look at this. This is deep stuff. I mean, this is core. It so, is. So they're bringing passion and, and long-term thinking and all these things into the daily practice inside your company. Yes, the vision. Vision is, uh, um, you know, when we had nothing going on at first, this, I said this to them probably a million times. I said, guys, we don't need capital. There's one form of capital that's more important than capital that most people think, which is money. We have social capital. I said all the money in the world cannot buy social capital. Social capital can't be bought. There is no price point you can put on social capital. It's priceless. We're on the same page. We're united. This is scary when a company is as united as us. I said, the thing you got to keep in mind is the competitor is going to do the following. And I knew a handful of names who were the mastermind manipulators that wanted to pin us against each other. I said, this is what they're going to say. And this is what they're going to do. And here's how they're going to do it. They're going to befriend you. And they're going to take three different approaches. One is befriend you and bash me and just look for some kind of a link for you not to like me so you can go deeper. Or another approach you're gonna take is befriend you and say good things about me, but push you away and saying, why are you gonna be in the shadow? And all of these dynamics we talked about, I said, I guarantee you, our only enemy 
is somebody outside trying to divide us apart internally. And if we can stay strong together here, one day we're going to look up and we're going to have a half a million insurance agents around the world and this be the largest financial marketing organization in the history of mankind. And we can do that together. And that's the vision part. And we started with 66 agents. Today we have 8,700 in 49 states. And so the belief in this becoming a reality is more and more and more. And they're starting to see it. Wow. Pat used to say one day the best comedian is going to come and entertain us. Friday night award ceremony, 5,000 people sitting in the room. Kevin Hart is entertaining. The number one comedian in the world. What are we doing getting a guy like that? Magic Johnson, Gretzky, Calipari, politicians, presidential, presidential candidates. What are all these people doing being in our circle now? How do we have all these contacts and all these connections now? This was all part of the vision that we mm -hmm. cast at day one. And uh, if the vision's real, I'll never forget an advice a man gave me, Bill Vogel. He said, you can, I said, our, our vision is going to be the following. Saving America through bringing back the free enterprise system and hope to American families. He says, you can't say that unless you fully mean it. Because if you say it and you don't follow it through, no one believes it. And so I took a step back for a couple months. I said, I don't know if I want to make this kind of a statement. Because it's a big one to make. Then I said, we're doing it. We had an event together called uh, Saving America, Doing the Impossible. I was dressed as uh, uh, George Washington. My wife was dressed as Lady Liberty. Another guy was dressed as Lincoln. 40 American flags, 40 foot Mount Rushmore. They had Ronald Reagan some come and speak on the, uh, what makes America special. We had Dudley speak on uh, uh, a Star Spangled Banner. Larry Greenfield, Dudley Rutherford, Larry Greenfield, who's the vice president of uh, Ronald Reagan Library. He spoke about capitalism. And everyone's sitting there saying, what the hell is going on here? It was a crusade, it was a cause. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just a, a, a gimmick, like let me try to get people excited, because a lot of people took that same statement to try to use it to excite people. But if it's not here, you can't act those things out. So this is, again, if the vision's crystal clear, and then you know how to sell it to people, and if you can get a handful of people that fully believe what you're saying and they buy in, from there on, if you stay true to the vision, the rest is history. And there's a bit of La Familia stuff in there as well, right? I mean, you in know, a big way. In a big way. In a big way. I mean, in a big way. Like, let me let me put it to, to the to the point of, if you do anything with anybody's wife, you don't want to get that call from me. You, you you don't you don't do that with me. I mean, I'm a very bad guy. If you cross someone's wife, you have a problem with me. Which are basic yeah. Sicilian rules oh, of business. We, yeah, sisters. Keep you your gonna, mouth shut. Stay, stay within the family. Oh, yeah. None of this other stuff because it's bad for business. Yeah, so you date somebody's sister. You, you better make that phone call. You know, you do anything with somebody's uh, the daughter. You don't do anything until you make that phone call. And then you got to make two phone calls. One phone call is to that person. The other phone calls to me. And then, you know, it's respect. This is why, uh, Brian, yeah. you know, in our company, I have a relationship with everyone's wives. And so they'll call and they'll talk to me and, and speaking to them and no one's worried. You know, our guys call my wife. It's a relationship, you know. And then, you know, with a, 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 a husband, you and I go out, say you and I have a drink together. I don't want the wife to be worried about what you and I are going to be doing together for them to be uncomfortable. I have to make sure there's that trust and that comfort there in our environment. It's not easy. Here's why it's not easy. I'm a man. And as a man, you see a beautiful woman, blood circulates to one place. I don't care if you're 18 years old or 40 years old. This is a scientific thing. I don't know why the man upstairs created it that way. You see something beautiful like, oh my gosh. You know, it's like, you know, in your mind and imagination, if you and I acted on every single thing we did in our imagination, we'd be in the porn industry. You know, because you know how we're wired and we want to act like we're so good and holy and all this stuff. Oh my goodness. You know, and I tell this to my wife. We'll go to a restaurant and I say, babe, look at that. Look at that right there, babe. It's like, oh, she's pretty. We'll go to a place that said, babe, if I was a girl, check that guy out. I says, no, he's handsome. We went to uh, some restaurant we were at in a flamenco show. I'm like, babe, that guy's pretty handsome. Guy says, no, he's handsome, babe. We have that relationship because what, am I going to lie about it? Like, what do you think happens? You know, so again, this isn't the idea of perfection or spiritual or holy because I, there's, I've never been attracted to that. I was, I work with a few people who, uh, were so much about, you know, if you do this, you're a menace to society. If you do that, if you do this, it was too, it's exactly what turned me away from church and being an atheist for 25 years of my life. 
exactly what it was. Right. That whole image of perfection. The morality, I don't the guilt, want, the yeah, shame. I don't want to go to church for you to tell me I'm going to hell. I know I'm going to hell. I just want to say I got a shot for heaven. So it's also not the dynamic of being judged. I want, I want to explain that part. So it's not like, you know, we have some of our guys that, you know, make some mistakes and say their marriage just doesn't work out. You won't get judged by me. It's not also not that part. You know what I'm saying? Hey, you made a mistake and we're gonna have a private conversation together, you and I. Um, it's just to realize, look, let's do our best. I'm not expecting you to be perfect, but let's respect one another. And when somebody has a downfall and they have a big fall, uh, be very careful if you judge them because yours is right around the corner. And when yours happens, you want people to judge you, hopefully the way you judge other people upon their fall. So you have to be very tender and gentle about it. I got a text message. I can't stand it, Brian, when people do this. I got a text message uh, uh, about two months ago. And it was a text message about a former competitor who got caught with another woman. Okay? Mm -hmm. And they sent me this picture. And I told them, I said, why are you texting me this? Why, wouldn't you want to know this? I said, don't ever text me something like this again. I blocked them. Then one of my guys sends me the text. Then an hour later, I have 10 text messages from 10 different guys in our company. Somebody with a blocked uh, phone number is sending text messages to us. He doesn't like that competitor. Now, the competitor and I had beef. I mean, he blocked me. It's a true competitor. He blocked me where he's like, you're a threat in the marketplace. You know, I can't do anything with you. Even with that, you will never see me go that route with that person. Because... Uh, uh, you know, life is too short. You're, I'm only 40. I have no idea what's going to happen next 40, 50 years. You don't know what's going to happen with your kids, with your family, with your parents, with your sister, with your peers, with your company. If you're going to go purely from that route of being perfect, there's only one place if you set the standard of perfection. Only one place, and that's a fall. Right. And Excellence not- is fine. Perfection is problematic. <laughs> it seems to me that Valuetainment and maybe PHP, they're both vehicles for pushing you to be a better man every single day. Because that's what they do, right? <sighs> the level of accountability, the way you put it, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a, one is an internal level of accountability with the people I work with at PHP. Value Timon is a public level of accountability. Yeah. Um, so that's a good way of putting it. I never thought about and it. And you that attracted way. that and set those structures about yourself subconsciously or, yeah. or consciously. But that's what it does. I mean, that's what this show does to me. I have to improve at an exponential rate because it's always out there always having to push myself. It's a very good point. It's a very good point. What's the future? What's five years from now? What's happening with Valuetainment and you? So I am uh, uh, currently looking for a CEO for PHP Agency. Um, uh, I've been in the process of looking for a CEO for the last 12 months. So I'm gonna be the chairman of the board and I'm gonna hire a CEO. And then after I hired a CEO, we're interviewing three CEOs next week. I've already had the conference call with them. We've had multiple calls. They've spoken to the board. We're having uh, uh, three uh, CEOs that will interview second week of uh, December, whatever that is. I don't know what the date is, like in the next 10 days. And by the way, everything I'm saying to you, this has been announced to the field in the last two years that I'm looking for a CEO. Um, And so that's that part with CEO. I'm looking internally at somebody to be the chief distribution officer of the company to kind of replace what I'm doing on the sales side. So this is probably going to be a 12 to 24 month window of this transition. It's not going to be overnight. It's going to be a process because I can't just hurry up with those decisions. A CEO for our company has to fit the culture. They have to make certain commitments that some are not willing to make. It's a long-term commitment with certain things in the contract that you have to write if XYZ event takes place. So that pushes a few people back. But that's kind of how we're offering the uh, uh, you know, uh, opportunity with the equity and the salary. So that's that part. Uh, Valuetainment is, uh, uh, you know, this will be the first place I'll announce this, which is kind of weird. So when we first uh, switched uh, uh, Patrick Bed David to Valuetainment, the YouTube channel, um, we're sitting in a room and I said, oh my gosh, guys, the name is Valuetainment. That's what we're going to name it. And I'm all excited, like a little kid, you know, jumping all over. We're all excited. That's the name. I guarantee no one has that domain. <laughs> you know, you know this whole thing. Like, we just came out with this idea. Probably no one has it. So we go on and buy Tim. Are you freaking kidding me? It's a publicly traded company in Germany. Okay, Valuetainment.com. I said, oh guys, we need that domain. So I call the guy right there. I call him. I say, we'd like to buy your domain. He says, excuse me. This guy's name is Dirk. I said, we'd like to buy your domain. I am the CEO 
of Valuetainment. It's a publicly traded company. Why would I sell you this? We're an entertainment company. It's a great name. I would never sell you this. So I got off the phone. I said, dang. So what are we going to do? So we sit there and say, guys, here's what we're going to do. We are going to make sure the world thinks about Valuetainment with us versus him. Because when you would type type Valuetainment on Google, he'd be the first one because it's Valuetainment.com. I said, we have to make sure we crush it with this name Valuetainment. So we do. So three years later, he changes his name to Valuetees. Okay, but he still owns Valuetainment.com. So then he sends me an email and he says, hey, I'll say the domain. I said, how much? He makes this number. It's like astronomical, a couple hundred thousand dollars. I said, we're not doing that. So he says, okay, no problem. So we went back and forth. Took us a, uh, uh, about a year to negotiate. Last week, officially, we own Valuetainment.com. So Valuetainment.com is going to probably end up being a media company. We haven't, if you go on the website right now, there's nothing. It's going to go straight to my uh, PatrickBayDavid.com. But we own the domain. And so Valuetainment.com uh, will be a vehicle to spread the message of entrepreneurs and capitalism around the world, especially at a time where a lot of people are being blocked if you talk about capitalism and entrepreneurship. I do want to create a platform where anybody can go to that's controlled, where you can see different views, and we keep spreading that message. So movies, shows, investing in anything that's going to spread the message of Valuetainment, attracting people that fit the criteria of Valuetainment, somebody that has off a value to offer but is absolutely entertaining and is bought into the movement, and then we're going to create a community and keep advancing other people, helping ways to advance everybody around the world that is part of the Valuetainment community. So that part's going to be uh, the next 20 years uh, of my life, being in the media world. I told myself I'll be financial 20 years. First 20 years was making sure I didn't kill myself or screw up and make a bad mistake to go to prison. The next 20 years, I said financial. I love the financial industry. The next 20 years is going to be media. And then you have the last 20 years, the fourth 20 years will be a different era of my life. Hmm. Do you like performing? Do you like being in the spotlight? I, I, uh, I think so. Yeah, I think I do. Uh, but I also like to, like, I'll, like first time when I talked to you and I came and I gave you feedback and I said, here's how I view you. I naturally can't help myself either, you know, looking at everybody as a product. Like I look, if I'm, if I'm your agent, I can market you very easily. So I look at you as a product. This is a very easy product to market. You belong on TV. I mean, that's hands down. There's no question about it. You're marketable. So everybody I look at, I look at them that way. I can't help myself. It's like the kingmaker side on what uh, can happen for this person. And sometimes some people don't like it because they're like, hey, why are you giving me advice? I don't want any account. I'm like, well, I'll step back. But I can't help myself. Everything I see is how we can make something uh, better. What happens when you look at yourself? What do you see? I think it's a marketable product as well. Um, and I think growing up as a kid, I missed the part of being playful because I had to be a father and a husband too early to my mother. I played the role of a husband and an older brother, even though I'm six years younger. So at 14 years old, I'm an overprotective younger brother to a 20 year old sister, which makes no sense at all, right? Yeah. And I had to play the father when my uh, husband, when my dad got the divorce and we're in Germany and my mother needed support. So I stayed with my mother for six years until she went to Iran. And then I joined the army. So I kind of miss that element. And there's a childlike uh, side of me that I want to seek. And uh, I think I'm going to pursue that the next 20. Uh, and I don't really know specifically which direction it's going to go. Have I seen this childlike side in you in some of the videos? Yeah, I mean, one went out today that's going to be childlike. That yeah. was the good voice that just went out. It's, it's the 20-year-old me talking to the 40-year-old me with a surprise at the end of the 80-year-old me that shows up out of nowhere, which is really epic. Are you in the 80-year-old like, makeup and stuff? Yeah, uh, you got of course it. You looks, are. It looks like I'm, you know, I'm 80 years old. So I don't know. I, I just like storytelling. I like, uh, you know, the first time I built a sales organization was called the Story Builders, and I was in uh, 2003, August, where the team was called I own StoryBuilders.com, and till today I have an email that's called Patrick at the StoryBuilders.com. But uh, I've always been fascinated by stories. Like even when I spoke to you, you know, MIT, San Diego, you know, where you went, and then Boston, you lived there, how that was, then New York. You know, I'm always curious about everybody's story. So, yeah, I mean, that's probably going to be the direction. Yeah, I like that playful side of you. You did grow up hard, and you grew up, I think, having to put this tough guy exterior on, you know? And I can see those elements in you and the chip on your shoulder. But, you know, there's yin and yang, you know? And there's feminine energy and male energy, and if you can't embrace that, it's, you're gonna snap one day. You know, we've seen that guy do that. And so I'm glad you're doing that, and I think that's 
it's going to be really good for you. And I think the viewers need to see that too. And I appreciate that. I appreciate you saying that. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. And I told Tony Robbins today, I said, uh, uh, and him and I were going back and forth. I said, Tony, the one thing I admire about you is the fact that, you know, you're able to speak your thoughts on religion and politics, yet you don't lose Democrats or Republicans because you know how to speak to everybody and you still give your opinion. And I think that's something all of us can learn from. It's not an easy thing to do because his, his, his reach is so wide. It's, it's crazy. It's wild. But I think it's also part of it because he's vulnerable and we see the childlike side of him as well. Yeah. You see this with McConaughey. You see this with Kevin Hart. You see this with uh, uh, Rock. You see this with the great ones. They have that. And it's such an attractive thing. So I, I appreciate that observation and, and what you're saying there. And, and you know, It's been hard to want to go there because you've had to keep a front for a long yeah. time. It's against everything you were taught and experienced, right? And you know what's helped me with that is my kids. You know, being around my kids, I'm a big Lego kid. Oh my gosh, I'm, have you been to the Lego store here? Uh, I have it always went on uh, Leicester Square, yeah. I haven't oh walked in there, it's good. Oh my gosh, the stuff they got stuck, I couldn't even leave it was so beautiful, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I play Lego all day with these kids. I'm a, uh, there's a side of me that's a big kid. And uh, by the way, I don't mind the other side either, the strong side. But I also know there's a time for this and there's a time for this and it may be a season of this right now. Yeah, good with the seasons, I like yeah. that too. Daily practice for you that's non-negotiable. What's something that you just repeatedly do that keeps you in the zone, keeps the chip uh, manageable, not gone? Anything you do. So, I mean, the thing that I do no matter what is study numbers every day. Hmm. I am in love with numbers. Interesting, you know, I you know don't have that background. No, well, like, listen, I mean, Brian, when I tell you numbers, like if you, if, you, if you see me right now in my briefcase, I have numbers. If you see me in my bag, I have numbers. If you look at my uh, iPad, I have numbers. If you come to my office, my entire, it's always a mess. My desk is always messy. And it's filled with numbers everywhere. And such detailed, specific numbers that makes no sense, I study it every day. Hmm. I, am, I am fascinated by numbers. Anything that can be tracked, I'm like a kid in a candy store with it. Okay, and that's what you're doing every day, watching uh, that it, business, it, watching. Yeah, I mean, I can tell channel. you reading, I can tell you reading books, I can tell you personal development, I can tell you exercising, but it's not every day. I work out five times a week. I, there are days that I may not get to reading. I try to read 30 minutes a day, but sometimes I'm not reading a book. I am studying every day. Like I'm studying a topic every day. That's, it, there's not a day that goes by that I'm not studying. I may not be reading a book, but I'm studying a topic uh, every day. You know, the other day I interviewed Jim Jenkins. Jim Jenkins was uh, uh, one of three uh, people in the autopsy room that held the uh, John F. Kennedy's brain. Yeah, yeah, so and I idea. flew him out. And for 55 years, he didn't do a live interview. So we brought him out and I took him to Dealey Plaza. And if you go on YouTube right now, you type in the word JFK, all over the world, I ask people on Instagram. People are telling me JFK is number one. If you just type in JFK, it was the first interview that came up. That's a pretty searchable word, JFK. Not even JFK assassination, just JFK. And so for me, oh my gosh, Brian, one week of studying this whole thing, I'm like, oh, this is insane. It's got nothing to do with business, but it's still studying. But if there's something I do seven days a week, 365, for the last 20 years, 15 years probably, it's numbers. Numbers, good answer, I like that one. Uh, best day of your life, worst day of your life, what comes to mind? Kids, kids, man, best day of the life is, is, is kids, you know, it's, it's very emotional. Uh, worst day of my life, um, worst day of my life is when we left Iran and I said bye to my dad. You know, uh, he gave me his necklace and I thought I was never gonna see him again. That's probably the worst day. Okay. Very hard. Okay. What scares you? Um, it's one thing and one thing only. It's not reaching capacity, like not meeting that guy. I wanna meet that guy. I wanna meet him so bad. I wanna have a sit down with him. I wanna speak to him. I wanna see what he looks like. I wanna see how he's wired. I wanna see what things he doesn't see as important as I think is, is today and what things he sees extremely important as I don't see today. I want to meet that guy. Um, so it's scary for me if I don't reach that. Right. That gives me anxiety. They say hell on earth is meeting the man that you could have been, right? At, at the end of your life. And you want to make sure that that doesn't happen. <laughs> I, don't want to, I don't want that to happen. Right. No. What would we be surprised to learn about you? Something that would just be like, I can't believe that that's what he does. 
what would you be surprised? I mean, to Legos learn? is a good surprise. I but. tell you, I mean, I am I am a toy guy. You know, I love Legos. I will, li- Brian. I'll sit and I'll build Legos for six hours like that. Wow. I mean, that's not like you know. Some people say it's a waste of time. Six hours and I build Legos. Like I buy Legos for kids, thinking I'm buying it for them. I'm not buying it. For them. I'm, I want to build it. I'm going to go back and build it. Legos is. Uh, uh, a big one. I'm a big baseball card guy. Right. Big. Yeah. I love baseball cards, especially like old 30s, 40s, 50s, maybe 60s. Not so much 70s, 80s, and past that. I'm a big baseball card guy. Um, diehard baseball card guy. And the one weird uh, thing with me is um, <laughs> um, is my affinity to Iran and Assyrians. Um, and Armenians, very big affinity there. I want to do something with Iran in a big way, and I want to do something with the Assyrian community. They don't have a country. We lost it a long time ago, and the Assyrians were the first warriors. They are pretty interesting people on what they did. They invented a lot of things that the world uses today. You have to go to the British Museum and see the Assyrian um, like carvings in the rock. Really? They're intense. Here. Yeah, here in British Museum, that's how I know who the Assyrians are because the stuff they created and they show the depictions of war and it's all carved out in stone, it's intense. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna do something, I, I can't wait to go to it. And by the way, I'm, I'm coming back in no time to London. I mean, it, it's already, this visit created so many, Pierce Morgan, Nigel, all these other people, you know, Lord, uh, 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 who's the, uh, the, the guy who had the Apprentice show, what's his name, oh, Lord, Lord Sugar. Lord Sugar. Yeah, yeah. All of these things and other business things that just came up from me being here uh, today for a couple of days. I'm coming back in no time, and I'm definitely going to go visit that. So, yeah, I'd say something there as well. My affinity to Iran, Assyrian, and Armenian community. Okay, tricky to do something with Iran or not, or does that make it more of an interesting challenge for you? I think it's risky to do something with okay. Iran. Like I wrote a book, uh, a, a fiction book I wrote that took me five years to write. Very controversial. My wife, my dad, my mom do not want me to publish this. It's just sitting there. It's ninety-six thousand words. And it, you're going to read that and you're going to say, what the hell does this guy think about? What's in the, this guy's brain? It's a complete different dynamic of a book I wrote. And it has to do with Assyrian, uh, Iran, and some other uh, elements to it. But, yeah, I mean, I want to go back and do something with that country. I think that country's got a lot of resources that they can offer to the world. But somehow, some way, a lot of people like to keep friction in the Middle East because the more they fight each other the more they can get what they want. Other countries can get what they want from the Middle East, the more friction. And UK is one of them, US is one of them, by the way. The more friction there is there. And uh, the last time Iran was uh, strong and Israel was strong and they were an ally, the Middle East was a very beautiful place. You and I would go to Iran all the time. The rich people would go to Iran to party, Sinatra, Elizabeth Taylor, all these guys, because Iran and Israel were good. The Shah had a good relationship with the Israel, for the most part. Uh, not fully, but for the most part, they were civil. Very strong military, very strong air force, very strong military was peace, so all the other guys couldn't do anything. The moment Iran fell, boom, friction everywhere. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a whole different conversation. Yeah, too. even the Italian mob bosses will tell you friction between the families isn't good for business, right? It's never good for business, but it's good for those that want to divide right. because they get to control. So you have to find out who those people are, if that makes any sense. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What keeps you awake at night? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of different things today. Some of it is personal life, um, family, dad, you know, my dad is 76 years old and, you know, he's at a different phase of his life. My, um, mother, I think about my mother a lot, you know, she, uh, uh, I think about her a lot with my family, what we've gone through, her having an experience of really being able to enjoy the rest of her life. Um. On the business side, I spend a lot of time thinking about our guys and what their potential is and them uh, wanting to seek that part. And then it's vision, crusade, cause, really. I mean, my mind is always circled around those things. Obviously, my kids, like when I was traveling here to uh, London, on the flight, the entire time I was just, I couldn't sleep. I didn't sleep a single minute on the flight here. I couldn't sleep for a minute on my flight here. I was just thinking about these guys. I'm looking at their pictures and old videos, kids, all these things. And they're six, five, and two. And the other day, my son's like, Dad, I'm about to be seven years old, February 1st. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're about to be seven. You're 11 years away from 18. What is going on here? So, you know, some of those things are putting a little bit more perspective in my life. But I'd say those are the things that keeps me up right now. Yeah, okay. 
Patrick, I always ask a few questions at the end. I'm gonna hit you with those. Uh, if I could give you a phone and you could ring up the 20 year old Patrick, this is probably pre-military, right? Military 17, 18. So okay. 20, I would have been just getting out of the military or s somewhat in the military. So. Okay. Um, if you could call that guy up, uh, when did you take the picture with Dorian? How old were you? 21. Okay, so right around there. That guy, I've seen that picture, I think. I've seen you in the bodybuilding days. I'll give him a bit of advice. What would you tell him and would he listen? Stop trying to, stop trying to impress everybody. That is not really in your top five priority list. Really stop trying to please the people that don't matter. These success secrets are only available on the London Real Academy. Become a member and get access to live shows, exclusive courses, my webinars, bonus content, meetups, live events, an amazing community, and much, much more. Now back to the rest of the show. Stop like forcing things, just kind of work more here than work. That's the advice I'd give to myself. I was so worried about here. Yeah. So worried about here. Image, 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 image. And this is so draining. I'd I, I put more focus on, on the inside than work the outside. Work on yourself, yeah. yeah. I get that message from you and most of what you do. Yeah. You know, it's subtle, but work on yourself. So on that same note, best advice you ever received could have been from a mob boss, a mentor, or a parent. Yeah, I mean, a man named Rich told me once in Diamond Bar, we're in a meeting and we're looking at everybody and we're in this backyard. Uh, it's a guy's house, Ed, okay? Beautiful home he had right next to Sugar Shane Mosley. And I'm in the corner, I'm looking at everybody. Everybody's having dinner and they're at these tables and I pull Rich aside, I said, Rich, give me the one best advice. And he starts, I said, no, I, I said, I want one above everything. And he said, you know, what's part of what I'm saying right now, he said, look at everybody here. They're all gonna read just a few books and learn a few quotes, few titles, few stories to tell from the books they read. And once they make a hundred quarter million, they're gonna slow down. He said, if you keep out improving these guys consistently, eventually none of these guys will be your competitors. And he was absolutely right. So I came back, I took self-improvement to a whole different level based on what he told me. And uh, it became an obsession. And I noticed, you know what? He was right. Because most people quote, then you have, you were thinking, grow rich. I've read How to Win Funds and Influence People. Have you read Rich That Poor That? Have you read it's a, the 20 books that everybody's read, right? And then you go deeper and deeper and deeper with the books that people don't want to read because it's technical. People don't like to read technical books. So if you really go deeper and you have a meaning for this word deeper than the average person does, you're going to be a tough person to. Uh, compete with, especially if you're not afraid of hard work. And so hard work is mandatory at that level, but most people don't keep improving. That was the best advice right. given to me. That's good advice. Yeah. To that 20 year old that's watching us right now, and let's say they want to be an entrepreneur. Maybe that's why they first heard about you, or maybe that's why they tuned in. Uh, what do you tell them? What's your advice to them for the next 20 years? I'm telling you, man, just spend some time asking the right questions from yourself. You know, spend, it, it question every single thing. Question every single thing politically, spiritually, relationship, parents, those 20 things that your parents told you a million times. Question it, you know, whether for you it's rich people are greedy or rich people are this or whatever it is, question everything and then ask yourself what you're looking for. Get clear on that. And I'm not talking about the selfish standpoint of, wow, this is why I'm gonna go out there and do whatever I wanna do and screw everybody. And I think there's and I feel bad because sometimes that message is being given from influencers on social media sometimes and if you don't, you can't make that statement and not go deeper. Screw everybody, forget everybody and da, 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 and the next thing you know somebody goes, screw you mom, screw you dad. No, that's not the message. The message is spend some time asking yourself about who you want to be and what kind of a life you want to live. And once you figure that part out, Create a set of values and principles that you want to live by and make sure your behavior in life matches those values and principles you want to live by. Because happiness to me comes from alignment. If my values and principles match the way I'm living on a daily basis and it's aligned, I'm happy. You know, unhappiness comes when your values and principles that you believe in doesn't match the behavior you have. You're miserable, you're bitter. So one, get clear on who you want to be and the life you want to live. Write out the principles and values that you believe you're willing to die for. Like, this is the stuff I'm gonna live by. 
and then go be aligned to that consistently with something clear that's important to you and you'll have an edge. But uh, most 20 year olds, unfortunately, we have this, this tool that we have all of us, the phone. We have this tool, it's a beautiful tool. But uh, you have so many opportunities to spend time on news feed, on Instagram stories and seeing what everybody else is doing versus actually getting clear about what you wanna do. So maybe if I'm 20 today, I'm probably taking a diet from my phone. Believe it or not, these are consumers who watch Value Tim. And I'm telling you, take a 30-day diet from your phone. Yeah. You know, maybe not a 30-day, but take a two-day, a weekend diet and just go dive deep into what you want to do. If you already know what you want to do, then put that tool to use. Really get to use. Learn about marketing. Learn about Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, uh, everything that's out there and put it to use. But first, get more clear on who you want to be and what kind of a life you want to live. Yeah. Go into that beach on Malibu, spend some time with yourself. All day. That phone is the, is, is the craziest designer drug ever invented, you know? And it's, Isn't it? It is. And it's, it's geared to make you not ask the hard questions and not go into the self-improvement. It's just there to kind of numb your mind and keep you entertained and, you know, it is dangerous. And so I say the same thing. I used to be up on people on the street. I'm like, I watched this great video about Dorian. And I'm like, okay, what'd you do? I watch the next video. I'm like, that's not why I'm here. That's not why I'm here. <laughs> I need you to take the next step. So, Patrick, I really appreciate everything you're doing out there. And again, you're fighting the good fight because on the outside, broadcasting is a bit like entrepreneurship. It looks like a lot of glamour, and uh, it's a lot of hard work. You know, it is really hard getting in that headspace. You do a lot of traveling. Respect to that, and you really go out and get yourself in front of these people with these messages. And as you told me earlier, it's rarely the ones that you think are gonna pop that actually have the most resonance with people. Because I think people, they want a story. You know, and Jordan Peterson talks about that. It's in mm -hmm. our DNA, right? We need to learn through storytelling. And I see you doing that. So respect to you and I all that stuff. That. And I'm you. glad you came on here because when I look deeper into your content, I see this core message, you know? And it's not such a tough guy thing to share what you did on that beach in Malibu and to put those 25 questions up on your website and say, guys, time to look inside. Whereas a lot of people in the quote unquote entrepreneur space are talking about Lambos and cash flow and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And mm -hmm. you're telling people, no, it's actually not about that. And I see the successful people in the space saying that message. And honestly, I'll be honest, I heard the same thing from guys like Dorian Yates and the Cardones and other people that sit in this space. They're like, get in touch with who you really are. Add value to this world. Take us all to another better place. That's the real mission in life. If you do all that, the trappings follow. Absolutely, no doubt. I mean, thanks for having me, man. Really, I, I respect you as a professional. Uh, and, and the way you do your interviews, it's very obvious. You go deep, you actually do research. I think the best way uh, an interviewer shows respect to the guest is by doing proper research, and you do that all the time. So much respect and props for what you do as well. My pleasure, and thanks for showing us this side of you today. I don't yeah. think anyone's ever seen anything like this. I don't this. know if they have. I don't, I don't think they, they have. have, but I appreciate you going there to that space. Sure, and, uh, no I problem. Look, I look forward to what you're doing for the next few years. Thank you. Patrick, thank, thank you so much. You. Appreciate you, brother. All right. Yes. The critics who always speak behind my back. Maybe I want to hear them remind me he's back, the great pretender. I hope this time he gets hurt. I love these guys, they give me fuel. You want to, to reach your objective, you want to achieve it, you're gonna have to be obsessive, you're gonna have to be obsessed. Feel what you do, feel it. If you're not feeling it, it doesn't matter. It's Chris Eubank Jr. Mm -hmm. How do you explain his prowess in the ring? Junior has that obsession, that genius, that magic. Genius is obsession, but it's in one area. You studied the sweet science for so much of your life. How do you walk away from it? Do you miss it? Mm -hmm. You, you can't walk away from it, I am it. And even when I dance, really I'm boxing. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, the one who strives valiantly. What was the worst day of your life and how has it shaped you as a, a human being? When I fought Nigel Ben, I stood like this. 
it was the mask this. The risk must be taken. That's why you are London realists. That's why we're here. We're tired of sitting still, watching it happen, happening for others. Let's do it.